Gemacast listeners, Hover would love to find a domain name for your passion. They'll automatically take 10% off your first order at the checkout using promo code JOMOCAST. My name is Christina Crook, and I am the author of The Joy of Missing Out. I want to welcome you to the JOMOCAST, a brand new podcast for founders and creators seeking joy in a digital age. JOMO is the joy of missing out on the right things. Life-taking things like toxic hustle, comparison, disconnection, and digital drain in order to make space for life-giving commitments that bring us peace, love, meaning, and joy. Let us be the ones who build communities, who know each other's names. Let us be the ones who spend our time well, who live every hour of every day. Let us be the ones who love ourselves, who embrace our strengths and weaknesses alike. These are the first three lines of the Jomo Manifesto. And when you become a patron of the Jomo work at patreon.com forward slash JomoCast, you will get a gorgeous letter press print of this manifesto as a mindful and joyful reminder of your desire to live a life with more joy and fewer screens. If you would like to become a patron, I would be absolutely thrilled. Again, it's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash JomoCast, and you can sign up there. And I'd like to welcome two new incredible patrons, Salima Ibrahim and Kathleen Forster. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast and the greater Jomo work. One other special announcement before we jump into this week's episode with Dr. Jess Piriam. I am going to be leading my first experience Jomo program retreat at Hollyhock Leadership Center in absolutely breathtaking British Columbia, Canada, October 17th to 21st this year. If you would like to join me for a very intimate retreat experience in one of the most magnificent, like truly breathtaking places in the world, please go to experiencedomo.com to learn more and register. I am absolutely excited and a little bit nervous because I've never run a four-day retreat, but I am so excited about the experience I'm creating for you. You can see a full schedule of the retreat and how it's all getting laid out. I'm just being honest about my nervousness because I'm a human and it's a new thing that I'm doing, but I believe you're going to be so, so touched and yeah, that'll be an incredible experience. So learn more at experiencedomo.com. That's it for announcements for today. Well, I am speaking today with Dr. Jess Piriam, and I want to share a quote from her, which has really helped me shape my thinking around technology use and this whole entire conversation about the joy of missing out. And it's a quote from Jess when she says, quote, I think it's really easy to say that all technology is bad or all technology is good, but it is really difficult to find that nuance and say, well, some of it is not helpful to me. And some of it is bringing great joy and meaning to my life, end quote. I think you'll really enjoy this episode because in it, we learn about digital sociology, so the study of technology and how it impacts our everyday lives. We talk about missing and wanting to reclaim more whimsy and serendipity in our lives. And we talk about how the internet can actually empower this. For example, Jess uses a website called Post Crossing to send and receive postcards with strangers all over the world, which brings great joy to her life. We spoke in my home office in Toronto. Jess Periam is a lecturer in sociology at the Open University and lives in London, UK, but she is here with me in Toronto. Hello, Jess. Hello. I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is where the magic happens. This is where the magic happens in my home office. So I'm going to tell you guys a little bit more about Jess. She received her PhD in sociology from Goldsmiths University of London in 2018, specializing in digital sociology and science and technology studies. She is currently co-chair of a new undergraduate distance education class called Understanding Digital Societies. And that is what we're going to be focusing a lot of our conversation on today. Yeah. yeah. I'm so excited. This is it's such a labor of love, this class that I've been working on. <laughs> Amazing. Well, welcome to the JomoCast. My structure for the JomoCast is going to be 
um, two conversations in a row, two episodes in a row that are really talking with creators and founders about how they're living joyfully with technology and how they're incorporating technology in healthy and maybe unhealthy ways and, and how they're wrestling with that. And in between, I'm super excited to have conversations with people like you, academics and thinkers and authors that can help us go deeper. So thank you for being part of this conversation, the very first one. Oh, such a pleasure. <laughs> so Jess, you're a digital sociologist. There are people listening that have never heard that term before. What is digital sociology? That's a good question because I've spent so many years explaining what digital sociology is, what a digital sociologist does, and that kind of thing. So um, I guess the best way to explain that is to take a few steps back and um, probably back to 2009, I was still working in Australia as a journalist at the ABC. And I started to notice the ways that we were using and sometimes abusing technology and social media. I mean, this was probably two or three years into people really starting to use Facebook. And I was just really interested in what the social impacts of that might be and how this uh, this new technology might impact the way that we relate to one another, both online and offline. So I really wanted to do some work around that. But being a journalist in a local radio station where you're writing 600 words or producing a five minute radio story every day, it's a little restrictive for going into that much depth. So I eventually left journalism and for a few years was just kind of floating about having a quarter life crisis as, as one does when you're 25. Um, and then I actually started thinking, no, I really want to look into this a bit further. And I just did not know where to start in an academic sense. So I, after some random Googling, I found out that Goldsmiths, uh, University of London was doing a master's in digital sociology. So I joined their second cohort ever in 2012 and spent a year learning how to code because the program was half computing and half sociology, learning sociological theory and thinking and applying that to, um, to technology and social media to help think through those kinds of things and eventually went on to do a PhD in it. And now I'm teaching it. So, um, digital so, sociology help us understand is that the study of societies? Then is that what sociology is? It is it okay. Is. Yeah, and so digital sociology is the study of digital societies, or the way digital impacts society. Is that correct? I mean, it can be, and I think that's one of the things that has been really interesting about being part of this at this point in time is that there are still people trying to define it. So many different people have different definitions for what sociology might be, but for the most part, and I think we've borrowed off digital geographers by saying that when we're talking about digital in digital sociology, we're really taking the digital and saying it can have three different use cases um, in sociology. So we can think of the digital as an object that we're going to study and think about it that way. Or we can think about the digital as a setting to do research within. So it could be our field site, for instance, or it could be a tool that we do sociology with. So um, it could be visualizing social media data or many other things. So that's kind of what we do, but still looking at that through a sociological lens and thinking about society. Right. So fascinating. Um, you are developing a course I am. right now called Understanding Digital Societies. Can you tell us a bit about that course and what maybe some could be kind of bring us deeper into what you hope the students will learn through it, but what we could learn through Understanding Digital Societies better? Okay. So Understanding Digital Societies is a second year undergraduate class that I'm putting together with some of my colleagues at the Open University. And what we're really wanting to do is introduce students in the social sciences to sociology theory in particular, but using examples of what they might come across in the course of their everyday life online. 
So um, in the first chunk of the class, we're talking about some of the theories such as the presentation of self in everyday life, which is this theory that Irving Goffman, a, a Canadian academic, but spent most of his time at the University of Chicago, um, put together in the mid 20th century. I think it's the 60th anniversary of his book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life this year. Can you help us understand a bit better what presentation of self means? What is we're presenting ourselves all the time. I think automatically when I hear you say presentation of self, I think, oh my goodness, I feel like I'm presenting myself all the time, especially online. I'm choosing how to present myself in the amount of words and the specific words I use to describe basically my whole being in a Twitter bio or <laughs> the things I choose to post in, you know, in a variety of different online spaces, social media spaces, the photos I choose to use on my website, all of these things. So I think presentation of self to me, that's automatically what I think of. Is that is that kind of what he's getting at? Yeah. I mean, that's the good thing about the presentation of self in everyday life. It does what it says on the tin and you can kind of begin to understand where Goffman might be going with that. So he did his, he wrote this book based on research that he did with a few communities around the world. Um, one of them primarily was with um, communities in the Shetland Islands, just off the coast of Scotland, in the 1950s. And he used some of that to develop his uh, his thoughts around having a front stage self and a backstage self. So one of the examples that he describes is these restaurant workers in a hotel in the Shetland Islands um, having their front stage self where they would be polite and effusive to their customers and um, and serve really fine food. Um, but then once they went behind kitchen doors, they would kind of let loose a bit and kind of, yeah, be themselves and eat local Shetland food and kind of be quite unapologetic about who they were and what they were doing. So that's really quite helpful in thinking about how we present ourselves in the world in certain social situations. But then the waters get quite muddied when you think about, well, how might that translate to online settings where you're being quite public? Front stage and backstage versions of ourselves. I can imagine you're hearing that and can relate entirely to what Jess is describing. I think the idea of performing in a certain sense, whether we're consciously thinking about it all the time, I think for most of us, it's in our subconscious. We're not, we, we're aware of the fact that we're making all of these choices all the time about how we are presenting self. Even like the decisions in the Shetland <laughs> you know, example seems quite limited, right? They're in a physical space, they're with people, whether they're choosing to be with people or not, that's obviously a choice that they have and who they socialize with. But it seems like the choices they had to make then were quite limited. And it almost seems like a liberation to think about <laughs> that they weren't having to think about how they were presenting an entirely different environment as we do online. I want to go deeper into this. Um, you know, th there's so many constraints around online spaces and the ways that we choose to present what I guess Goffman calls a front stage self. What do those constra constraints do to us that, you know, we're constrained by the structure of email or social media or whatever we're using online? Like what, what are we actually doing to ourselves by being constrained all the time? Yeah, I mean, to keep the the dramatic analogy going with Goffman, I feel like um, social media presents us with a certain set of props that we can act alongside. And they're quite limited, but then we also aren't able to manage our audiences that well. I mean, the workers in the Shetland Islands, their audience was right in front of them and gave them quite immediate feedback. Whereas you post something online and you're never quite sure how it's going to land, who's going to see it. 
And there's a an American sociologist called Nancy Bame who works out of Microsoft Research in Boston who's written about this specifically in relation to musicians and how they manage their audiences online because in one sense musicians rely on social media to be able to promote themselves but then also the fans want to know more about these musicians so they feel that connection with them but then you have some musicians who are like well maybe there are parts of me that I don't want to share or if I shared this particular part of myself I would lose fans because they might not agree with my political views or a whole range of other things. So it's it's how do you manage audiences that you may not have intended to right. have there. And I think in a personal sense, I mean, you've always had that moment where you've posted something online and someone from a completely random context will pop up and say something and you, you just don't expect that and everyone else can see that interaction as well. And it's a bit awkward, right? I've had interactions where someone kind of came, this has only happened to me one time that I can remember, but I posted something which I thought was a bit innocuous and someone came after me, my neighbor, like someone I know from down my street. (laughs) And then I had a friend back me up, you know, like another friend jumped in and she's backing me up and then they're into it. And it's just such a strange a strange experience because you're just completely out of control. I mean, if you were physically in a room together or like the Shetland, I keep coming back to the Shetland (laughs) folks, but you know, they're behind the restaurant, you know, they're having a beer, what have you, someone gets into it. Like it's clear who the actors are. And in this case, I happen to know both people, but in so many situations, you don't actually know who those people are. And so what do you do with that? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I think that's just what we're beginning to look at in these settings and this is where it's really exciting for researchers they can think about Goffman's work and then think about where it does work where it doesn't work where the boat might need to be pushed out a little further so I think that's really interesting and I don't have any particular answers for how you manage that but there is that kind of temptation to tone yourself down so as not to not to cause a ruckus, or at least for me, that that's how it feels sometimes. Right. I'm sure there are other people who have not a care in the world. This is it. So I, I'm I'm excited that this is where the conversation is leading because I think, well, I know that there's this buzzword around, you know, influencers online and how people are hungry for authenticity, and that's become a word that no longer has any real meaning because what is really authentic, and I when we talk about front stage and backstage versions of ourselves, I automatically think, you know, is the ideal situation one in which we do meaningfully bring those into meaningful contact with one another where our public selves and our private selves are the same? Like we're not trying to put up something, we're not trying to project a certain persona in one space and, you know, and be very different, say in a private space. What do you think about that? I think that takes an enormous amount of self-reflection and actually thinking about yourself in both public settings and private settings and online settings. And some sociologists would argue that a public-private divide no longer really exists or an online-offline divide doesn't really exist anymore. So in that case, I, I would really have to say, well, it's it's about how do you feel about yourself regardless of where you happen to be inhabiting and where you happen to be being yourself but it's it's really tricky I feel exhausted by it I think a lot of people feel exhausted by it by the decision making that goes into how we present all of the time it's one thing to think about how should I dress this morning and go out and present myself in the office or where I work or in my neighborhood it's another thing to think about all of the audiences that we want to perform for be public for online because it is a public thing once you step into the internet um it seems feels exhausting to be making all those decisions and also thinking about how that's going to be received will it be received well will it not be received well i think you and i were having an interesting earlier conversation about how we feel like 
<laughs> the choices we're making about what we share online are actually creating like this vanilla version of ourselves. Like we're thinking so much about it that we're curating it and toning it back. So we don't want to seem like weirdos. We don't want to seem all over the place. We don't want to share so much private information that people are like, whoa, overshare. Like, <laughs> so are, are our only options becoming a vanilla version of ourselves or like an erratic, untrustworthy strange eccentric person online like what are are those our only two options I hope I hope they're not the only two options although you're right I, I do uh towards the vanilla simply because I'm just I I guess I well actually there was a really funny instance of maybe a few years ago where I applied for a job and at the very end of the um the interview Someone said, oh, I, I've been through your Twitter profile and here's what you said back in 2011 about the weather in in this completely different city in the UK. And I was like, "Right, cool. So you've scrolled through my Twitter like, about six years ago like that. That's That's fantastic. But then that's also that thing. Like you're presenting yourself, but you're presenting yourself forever. Mm -hmm. And it's. It's. I think that's where I kind of think, oh, maybe it's time to be vanilla about those things. But how dull? How it dull? Is really dull. <laughs> it gets really boring, and then I just get quiet because it just doesn't seem worth it, you know, to just struggle through what to share and what not to share. And I have friends, you know, who do share just about everything. I mean, they're constantly online. They're you know self described as very online people. Um, and they do share a lot of things. But I know that those are all decisions, again, around that front stage version of themselves. There, It may seem off the cuff, but there is still always a motive and a thought about what they're going to post. They are, you know, sharing things about their private lives, but they are making those decisions. It's not like someone just saw them on the front stoop crying in a moment. It's a decision about, oh, I'm going to tell you that I'm crying on the front stairs in this moment. So it's interesting. And I think the whole, like you were describing, someone going back into your Twitter profile six years back and pulling something out does sort of instill this sort of fear of God in terms of, I got to really think this through because it does ultimately impact employability and all these different things. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. Like I felt like in that situation, it was this weird power play, which just caused it an awkward situation to be quite honest. I was like, cool. You can, you can scroll. Well done you. This episode is brought to you by hover.com. Everyone's got their thing. My thing is the joy of missing out and Hover's is the joy of free domain registration privacy. Hover is an incredible company actually based here in Canada, which is where I live. And I use Hover for all of my domain registration and I have for years and years. I'm thrilled that they are here on board with the JomoCast in the very first season. And as a listener, you can go to hover.com forward slash JomoCast to get your next great idea registered in a domain at Hover. So thank you to Hover for sponsoring season one of the JomoCast. A workaround is that people have multiple accounts. What are your thoughts about that? They have sort of their, their professional, you know, put together version of themselves. And then they have these sort of like these other accounts where they kind of let it rip. What are your thoughts about having multiple accounts for multiple parts of your personality from a digital sociology perspective? Um, I mean, I think it's very interesting. And I think there have been researchers who have been able to study this phenomenon. So um, I think Crystal Abedin, who's based in um, Australia, immediately comes to mind doing research on Instagram. So fake Instagram accounts, which are more a teenage thing of having a fake Instagram account that isn't so public. So you're just kind of sharing among friends and maybe creating that backstage experience for those closest to you. But it just, it's a lot of management. And I think it's a lot of deciding which version of yourself goes where. And that's, that's very difficult. 
I can't really throw a sociological theory at, at that off the top of my head. Well, that, I mean, that naturally leads into this concept of the divided self, right? That we're old and, and I have a picture in my mind of like the cow and how it's like cut up into steak and all these pieces, like it's divided up and we have all of these parts that we're managing all the time. And this isn't new to the online space. Of course, I remember being a teenager and I did not have the internet and, you know, there were decisions made about who am I going to be with this friend group? This existed pre-internet, the idea of who I'm going to be with a certain group of people. But if we want to be, which I hope that those of us listening, myself included, if we want to be more whole people, if we want to bring ourselves fully into the world as creators, as makers, as as people, then having those things integrated more fully, I think, is the way that I hope to walk. And in my online decision making, I do sometimes share quite personal things online because I never want people to think. I never want people to think that it's all together. Like I just never want people to look at me particularly online and think her life is just tickety-boo. She has no struggles because that is 100% not reality. And I think that the more we have the conversations around everyone struggles, everyone is always going through something. Yeah, there are are so many things to say to that. And I think in particular, I mean, in some senses to have a divided self may not necessarily be a terrible thing. Like we're as people, we're not we're not static, we're not even killed by any stretch of the imagination. And every person we relate to, we relate to differently. And that's the joy of friendship and relationship with others is that we react to other people and and in that moment we relate to like you say something, I say something. Um, we might find that funny. We might have a moment where we completely talk at cross purposes, but that's, that's the joy of building friendships and relationships in that sense. Um, and I think in those circumstances, it can be really difficult to, um, to translate that online. I mean, I've started some brilliant friendships on Twitter and I'm really grateful for them, but, um, there are also those struggles. I mean, especially as an academic and a relatively early career academic, I find Twitter a minefield. So I I feel like I can't talk about the realities of being an academic because it's unpalatable or a, a hiring committee or someone might be looking out and tell me not to do that or might yeah. Things might pass me by if I I'm brutally honest, but then also I can't stand the uh, the genre of I am pleased to announce kind of humble brag. I've published this paper here or have this amazing new position because all of those things are incredibly difficult to do. And I think everybody knows how difficult it is and knows that that process is difficult and a lot of rejection and heartache comes from that, especially the way that academia is in this day and age. And yet being honest about that is is difficult. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe the next time I get a rejection for an article, I, sh- I should say, I'm pleased to announce that I've been rejected. <laughs> Do it. Please tag me. I'll, I will celebrate with you, your honesty. <laughs> yeah, there's so much there. I'm wondering if we could each share before we wrap up today, maybe, and this is sort of off the top of our head, so I don't know if you'll be able to think of someone, but Someone who you feel that you follow online that's doing a good job of sort of balancing this public and private version of themselves, the presentation of self. Is there anyone that you follow that you feel grateful for the ways in which they share their life that inspires but doesn't inspire in a way that makes you feel bad. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like the people that are like, you're just winning all the time. And so I don't want to follow you anymore because I feel bad at my about myself. <laughs> Those people exist. There are people that are doing this well. I feel like there are people that are yeah. doing a good job of these types of things. Absolutely. So um, off the top of my head, um, there's an academic friend of mine called Nick Siva, who's based out of Tufts University in Boston. And he, his research is about, um, 
algorithms and recommendation algorithms. But alongside that, he's kind of just tweeting about the realities of being a dad, and he's really lucky. He's got very cute kids. But I, I just really admire that he can be honest about his work and his engagement in his work, and also just bring in the cuteness of his kids and his family life at the same time. And I think that's as authentic as you can get sometimes. There's an artist I follow. She's based in Portland. Her name is Lisa Congdon, and she does incredible illustration work. Where she came to her work as an illustrator much later in life, like late 40s, um, has a re- quite a remarkable story. But I feel like she does an amazing job of sort of taking you, even though she's like a high achiever and 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 has a quite an unbelievable capacity for creating a lot of work. She's very candid about the process, and I really appreciate that about her, uh, how she manages multiple projects, rejection, something that she just tried her hand at because she was just feeling like this was something that she needed to do, but she had no idea what would happen with it. And then, you know, eight years later, it pops out again and she does something really interesting with it. Being a part of that process for me is really um, like being able to observe that process. I really enjoy. Yeah, that's uh, amazing because I think especially in the creative and artistic communities online, we very usually only see the the finished product, which is amazing and beautiful. And we should be thankful for being able to see that. But sometimes the process is incredibly cu- encouraging. So when I was finishing my PhD, I felt incredibly uncreative, like as uncreative as you could feel. I mean, you've written a book yourself, Christina, you know how I feel very uncreative at the end. (laughs) Yeah, because you're just going through edits and it's it's tough. So I decided to enroll in a drawing class because I felt like I wanted to be creative and learn something new, but I also felt like I couldn't draw because I don't know, it's one of those things that gets beaten out of you if you think you can't draw at the age of eight. You're just like, no, I can't draw ever. It was the single best decision I made in 2018 to do that drawing class because I had the most encouraging drawing teacher who would help us through the process. And she devoted an entire week to the happy accident. So she forced us to be in positions where we couldn't work in pencil. So we couldn't erase anything that we didn't like. So we had to just work with it and continue to make a beautiful piece of art. And I enjoyed that so much. And I wish we could be more happy accident. Yeah, like what's possible in the tactile, physical, embodied world. We're actually talking the day after the podcast launch party that happened in Toronto. And last night we talked a little bit about whimsy. (laughs) You know, just the whimsy. It just feels like online there's very little whimsy. And so the playfulness, but you were saying you were actually looking for that online, didn't you? Yeah. And I I do feel, I mean, some people would kind of kick back at that and say, oh, whimsy does exist online. You just have to look at memes and GIFs to know that there's whimsy there. And I I think, yes, that's whimsy, but that's also a lot of in-jokes that you have to be a part of. And it needs to be something simpler. I have an Instagram account, which is just a lot of shop fronts of laundromats or laundrettes, (laughs) simply because I thought these laundromats are disappearing and quite often they're quite retro and fun and let's do that. Jess, thank you so much for being with me today. No problem. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for listening. You can learn more about our guests in the show notes and by visiting jomocast.com. The Jomocast is edited and produced by Thomas J. Inge, musician and composer by day, podcast ninja by night. Special thanks to writer Rebecca Wigand, musician Peter Katz, and educator Adam Kaplan for their practical and moral support creating this season of the podcast the JomoCast is listener supported. When you sign up as a patron at patreon.com forward slash JomoCast, you'll get access to many bonus episodes with me and digital sociologist, Dr. Jess Piriam. Plus, we'll send you a Jomo Manifesto letterpress print, stickers, and a handwritten card in the mail because I believe in the power of the personal. Plus, snail mail is just one of the most joyful things on earth. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review it on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you subscribe. And a five-star review would be spectacular. 
Do you want more Jomo? Go to experiencejomo.com to sign up for a free week of Jomo Quest to get you started on your journey. As always, remember, there is joy missing out on the right things. I'm your host, Christina Crook. Thanks for listening.